Hello and welcome to Development Matters. On the program today, we debate dual citizenship. If you really love your country, then that shouldn't be an issue for renouncing your citizenship for wherever you are, come back home and lend your support. There are a, whole, a pool of Liberians in Liberia holding government positions and otherwise, who actions can otherwise be described as very unpatriotic. Are they more loyal to those abroad who sent an estimated half a billion dollars a year? Also on the program, we feature a young Liberian entrepreneur who is also helping many market women get started. We've been able since July of 2015 to disperse up to 18.5 million Liberian dollars, which sums to about 180,000. You come to pay? Yeah. Our rate is really good. Then in our development special feature, we take a look at the Forestry Training Institute of Liberia. The forestry sector of Liberia is our hope for sustainable livelihoods. I know that the forest is a, is a very important resource in my country. Training forest rangers to protect the Liberian tropical rainforest. Then we look at the life of Lot Carey, arguably the first American missionary to Africa and one of Liberia's founding fathers. Lot Carey was able to raise $700 in five years to have himself, along with a few selected missionaries, go to Africa. I long to preach the gospel. I will make it to Africa, the land of my forefathers. I'll be free. But we begin with our debate on dual citizenship, as we now join our moderator on Let's Debate It. Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome to today's debate on dual citizenship in Liberia. My name is Leon Mensa and I'll be the host for today's uh, discussion. Currently under Liberian law, if you're a Liberian citizen and you obtain the citizenship of another country, you automatically lose your Liberian citizenship. Is this right? Is this good for Liberia? To answer this question, we've got two prominent Liberians who will be debating this issue on the proposition that dual citizenship is good for Liberia. Speaking on behalf of, of the affirmative is Mr. John Lloyd, and arguing against the affirmative will be Mr. Isaac Smith. We have an audience in the studio, and we would like to get the opinion both before as well as after the debate. How many of you are for the affirmative? So we've got four individuals, excellent. And how many are against the affirmative? We've got three, fantastic. Mr. Law, you've got three minutes. Thank you very much, Leah. The issue of du dual citizenship has been put into focus in the last decade because of the resulting effects of the civil war which occurred in Liberia. Over a period of a decade and a half, Liberia lost an estimated 1.5 million of its citizens to nations abroad. With that outflow of its citizenry, Liberia lost a huge pool of educated individuals, and it divided our country between those abroad and those at home. At this time of reconstruction in our nation, the focus now is upon how we can regain these lost resources contained within the talent pool of our natural born citizenry abroad. How can we attract the capital that they have in foreign countries? How can we regain the educational resources that can be brought back to rebuild our economy and our social systems? And also how we can attract the talent pool to bring in innovation that is necessary for reconstruction and development of our nation. And now we're on to Mr. Isaac Smith, again, who will argue against the affirmative. Thank you very much, Liam. It is indeed no doubt that every country has the right to require of its citizens total loyalty. For now, we have citizens who are considered citizens of America and Liberia who themselves believe that they are by far better than Liberians who have equal level of education, training, skills, and abilities. We have seen situations where people come to Liberia not necessarily because of their love for country, perhaps for what they can gain. And when there are times of crisis, we have those very people fleeing the country. So I believe that dual citizenship is not uh, an issue that should be granted. Uh, 
create a situation of split loyalty, and uh, it is not good for the country at this time. Thank you both gentlemen. And now we'll move on to, you both get a chance to rebut each other's uh, points. First of all, let's address loyalty. Loyalty cannot be defined merely in the context of an individual residing in his own country perpetually and not uh, going to any foreign land. We have to look at this argument from the context of how our citizens, an estimated 1.5 million, fled the country through a process of civil war. They left this nation and went to foreign lands to seek survival. And in that process, they gained employment. That employment was transformed into remittances, an estimated half a billion dollars that is sent back through Western Union, MoneyGram, and through other sources on an annual basis that keeps our economy alive. As a matter of fact, on a per capita basis, Liberia is the second in the world in terms of remittances and in terms of foreign di direct aid to, to, to the nation by its foreign nationals. If you calculate the, the, the total amount of uh, foreign aid we get from other governments and other international organizations, uh, the remittances of Liberians alone uh, surpass that number by far. We can transform the disadvantages that we had throughout the Civil War into an advantage if we attract and properly attract our own nationals back home. And now on to Mr. Smith for his rebuttal. Uh, we cannot overemphasize the, the social effect that dual citizenship will have on our country. Uh, for example, there are Liberians who are in colleges in Liberia who have had experiences and training and skills and abilities to do many things as Liberians from the United States who go back home. But the preferences are always given to Liberians from abroad. To, to continue with the split loyalty issue, when, for example, we had the Ebola crisis in Liberia, there were many Liberians who were American citizens. The first thing they did was to take the flight, leave the country. And now let's move on to our audience. What has been done when it comes to making sure that, for instance, a Nigerian who has come to Liberia and we're accepting them to naturalize, and uh, what is the assurance that they've given up, given up their birth citizenship? With the issue of other nationals coming, if there is a problem with our immigration system, our naturalization system, then we need to tighten it up so that we can ensure that those who are coming in are uh, doing what they ought to do as naturalized citizens. But I think my concern is for Liberians to have total and absolute loyalty to the country. You have a lot of uh, Liberians in the diaspora who are very educated. There, there's a lot of people in the health fee, in education fee that Liberia could benefit from. And you talk about the, 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 the remittance that goes to Liberia and, and what it entails. And I think the, the last um, 2016 World Bank figure showed that it's about 29% of GDP. And so you can elaborate on that. There are a whole lot of benefits, you know, uh, alluding to what you're saying that can be gained economically. But this particular issue of dual citizenship has been a fertile ground for demagogues who have a shallow argument of loyalty and they use that basically to create a social divide between Liberians abroad and, at, and Liberians at home. Now we're going to move into closing arguments. For the proposition that dual citizenship is good for Liberia. And we'll start off with Mr. Smith. Liberia needs every Liberian. I think it is time now that if Liberia is where your heart is, then you will go home with total and complete loyalty for your country. Dual citizenship has become an issue that has been used for economic gain. Even within the United States where there may be laws against dual citizenship, it has been relaxed to the lowest level for economic opportunities for their own nation and, and for the development of their citizenry. So I thank you very much for this opportunity and I look forward to the law of 1972 being repealed and that dual citizenship become the law of the land in Liberia very soon. Okay, so you've heard the arguments. So let's see, you know, how have audience of uh, uh, changed or not changed their perspective from the uh, from the discussion. So, by show of hands, who's for the proposition of dual citizenship uh, in Liberia? 
Wow, so we've got five. We've got one convert. And who's against? Two. Well, there you have it. You know, thank you for your contribution to this you know, critical national debate on dual citizenship in light beer. Thank you to the audience also for watching. My name is Leon Mensa. Until next time, good night. This is Development Matters. When we come back, we profile a young Liberian entrepreneur who is helping many market women get started. Yeah. I'm talking about my unborn future. No matter what you ask, then my message will reach you. Corruption killing all, we're not satisfied. Welcome back to Development Matters. And now, we profile a Liberian entrepreneur. She has come a long, long way from being a teenage single mother. The year of my 19th birthday is when I had a child and I was even put out of school. She would go on to earn an MBA, work with the Goldman Sachs program to empower women. I kind of like headed that program. Then head the Small and Medium Enterprises Division of the Liberian Ministry of Commerce and Industry. That job was really the one that exposed me to the Liberian business environment much more than even the Goldman Sachs jobs. With that experience under her belt, she set her sights on launching her own business venture, Business Link. And the reason I gave it the name Business Link is because I felt like it should be the link of small businesses either to the banking sector, it should be the link to the business registry, to the tax agent. I mean, whatever link there is that they themselves cannot breach found a ready customer base in women running very, very small businesses. When we started Business Link, it wasn't about women. But when you go to the market, the typical Bidabo seller, the Pepe Cala seller, the street vendors, several of them are women. However, generating revenues from her targeted clients of small business women was initially tough. But a few key consultancies helped her bottom line. Because we didn't have much money, we started taking on to bigger consultancies like tax incentive processing for bigger firms. Like we were able to serve more river breweries, more like real Coca Cola bottling company. She plowed the proceeds from her consultancy business into micro loans for women. But then Ebola struck. I invested like 12000 But believe me, after Ebola crisis, I lost it all. Once again, she looked to her consultancy business for help. And so my consultancy now after Ebola was what helped to pick it up again. By July 2015, she was back to giving micro loans to women, most of them selling very small items in the local markets. We've been able since July of 2015 to disperse up to 18.5 million Liberian dollars, which sums to about 180,000. You're paying back a 3.5% on a monthly basis as interest. All of the 780 women that have received microloans from Business Link get basic training in how to run a business and manage their money. Business money and family money, yes, oh? Yeah. That's somebody tell me what they call business money. Business money is money that are given to you to manage it. That training has produced the desired results. So, our payback rate is really good. Then. You come to pay? Yeah. We've not written off any of our loans. For virtually all of its customers, who otherwise would have no access to financing, Business Link's microloans have been a game changer. I started Business Link when one of my friends told me about it. My table was small like this. They told all I went. I told my husband concerning about Business Link. He went he faced big table for me from this level. To this business need make it, I extend my business. After the training, they gave me 20,000 at the end of the And that's why I've been selling all so far. I stand on my own, I can go purchase my, my fish, I can sell on my own. So, business need is a help to me a lot. And to some of my friends that I've been carrying that too. Me and Kevin to business day, for me to get money, I have to do my business. And go there, they give me the money, they show me how to take care of my business, how to keep money, how to manage for the business. Thanks to Edwina Dolacier Vacun, founder and chief executive officer of Business Link, who's been empowering these women, turning them into entrepreneurs, enabling them to take charge of their own lives. And, by the way, the daughter she had as a teenager 
is now a college graduate and a young professional prepared to walk in her mother's footsteps. I'm definitely taking all the notes that I can and learning everything I can every step of the way from her so that I can um, get into that someday. And now for our development special feature on the Forestry Training Institute of Liberia and its role in protecting the Upper Guinea Forest. The forestry sector of Liberia is our hope for sustainable livelihoods. I really want to be a forest ranger because I know that the forest is a, is a very important resource to my country. They are future forest rangers, training to protect one of Earth's most valuable ecosystems, the Upper Guinea Forest. Spread across six West African countries, and originally covering 1.2 million square miles, much of the forest has been lost to widespread logging and unsustainable use of forest resources. Today, the largest portion, some 40% of the remaining forest is in Liberia and the country has taken some bold steps to protect and conserve this valuable resource. According to the Liberian Forestry Law 2006, it prescribed that 30 percent of the total forest area should be left for protected area. That means no one go in to do hunting, logging, farming, or what have you. It only be there for conservation. Our topic today. That is why these young men and women undergoing training at the Liberia Forestry Institute to become forest rangers are critical to the government of Liberia's long-term efforts to protect the Upper Guinea. It's the forest rangers who have used or who protect the forest and its biodiversity. They are the front line soldiers, we call it. So they assign a logging company, they assign a sawmill, they assign a checkpoint, they assign protected area. Over the period of the four years we have created close to almost 200 rangers. But to properly protect Liberia's forest resources, it must churn out more rangers. So it will train more rangers for the Forestry Training Institute. At least a thousand rangers. We can protect those, those era. However, they face severe limitations. Like many things in Liberia, the Forest Institute was heavily damaged during the 14-year civil war that ravaged the country during the 1990s and the early 2000s. But after the war, you can see for yourself the devastation of this campus. Mm -hmm. The roof, everything down. As a result, the school lacks adequate facilities to house staff, instructors, and students. Living quarters are in poor state. Classrooms and lecture halls are in bad shape. The school is doing all it can to cope. They raise and grow right here some of the food the students consume. They also prepare much of the furniture they use here, chairs and desks for classrooms and beds for dormitory rooms. But there is a challenge to provide the students and staff the facilities they need to produce optimal results. We don't have books in our library. We don't have laboratory. The students are motivated. We are trying to protect the tropical rainforest and improve biodiversity. Yeah. Yeah, I think we are actually trying to identify species, and this species is called Afima terragapoli. They only need Liberia and its partners to provide them the space and facilities they need to acquire the knowledge and skills they will use as forest rangers to protect the Upper Guinea. Development matters. We'll be back in just a moment. Be wise. You must open your eyes. Don't follow somebody before you see up in the crowd. If I would know, if I would know, it's not in stock. This is Development Matters. 
By any measure, Latkere lived a remarkable life and was crucial to the founding and independence of what we know today as Liberia. We now take a look at one of Liberia's founding fathers. Take yourself back into the late 1700s and early 1800s. What comes to mind? There are many that will think of slavery. It was a very difficult time for individuals of color, taken away from family and loved ones, shackled to enemies and people of other nations within Africa, and taken away to lands unknown to them under brutal conditions. But that did not stop many to find and make their way back to Africa. Many have fought to gain their freedom, and some even managed to buy their freedom. Among those individuals, you will find a man by the name of Lot Carey. Lot Carey was born 30 miles away from Richmond, Virginia around 1780. Blessed to have both parents, his father was a well-respected member of a local Baptist church, but Carey did not become involved until he was in his late 20s. With expressing interest in the church, he soon learned to read and was later licensed by the church. While ministering to slaves around the area, he was also a laborer for a local tobacco warehouse. He was such an excellent worker that he eventually had an annual salary of $800 and was also able to earn extra money by selling pieces of tobacco. In 1813, after the death of his first wife, he saved enough money to buy his freedom along with his two children. Within that time frame, Lot Carey was able to raise $700 in five years to have himself along with a few selected missionaries go to Africa. In one of Lot Carey's last few sermons, he shared this. I am about to leave you and expect to see your faces no more. I long to preach the gospel and salvation. I don't know what may befall me, whether I may find a grave in the ocean or a more savage, savage wild beasts on the coast of Africa, nor am I anxious what may become of me. I feel it is my duty to go. What is that gonna do for us? I wanna be here to take care of you, to help you, help our baby right here because I love you, and it's not going to be the same. And I can teach English, math, and science, and mostly preach the Word of God. I will make it to Africa, the land of my forefathers. I'll be free. I ain't no pioneer. On January 16, 1821, Lot Carey, along with others, set sail from Virginia to West Africa. But sadly, after 44 days of travel, Lot Carey's second wife passed away. It was in 1822 that Lot Carey moved to Monrovia, Liberia, where he quickly became popular and ministered. He was soon able to establish churches all over and was also able to open schools by 1826. Towards the end of his life, Lot Carey was given the responsibility to care for former slaves that have arrived in Liberia. Even though some were recaptured, he was able to help some regain their freedom there in Liberia. In November 1826, Lot Carey tragically died from an explosion that happened while in the process of making bullets. Lot Carey lived a life that helped inspire others to seek God's face. It has also motivated others to venture to different parts of the world and spread the gospel. Lot Carey's mark on the world as the first American missionary to Africa is etched in monuments in Liberia and in the United States. Lakeri established Liberia's first church, the Providence Baptist Church, in 1822, which still stands today in the heart of the capital city, Monrovia. The Lakeri Mission School in Broville, outside Monrovia, has educated young people from kindergarten to 12th grade since 1908. Carysburg, a city right outside Monrovia, is named after him. Cary Street, located only a few blocks from Providence Baptist Church in Monrovia, carries his name. In the USA, there's another Cary Street in Richmond, Virginia, and a lot Cary Road 
in Charles City County near his place of birth. The Lot Carey House is a designated state historic landmark in Virginia and is on the U.S. National Registry of Historic Places. The Cary Town Shopping District in Richmond, Virginia is also named after Lot Cary. The Lot Cary Foreign Mission Convention, based in Washington, D.C., continues to impact the lives of people beyond Liberia and the United States. This is Development Matters, and now we get a letter from the Diaspora. Dear Liberia, this letter is to my fellow citizens of Nibak County. The purpose of this letter is to urge everyone to become actively engaged in defending the basic safety net of services that our youth and their families depend upon. A lot of services and support provided in Nibak County are delivered by nonprofit organizations such as the United Nearby Citizens Council, UNICO for short, based in the United States. Every year, UNICO chapters across the nation raise funds to support education in Nearby County. In 2013, UNICO chapters raised enough money to ship a container of medical supplies, including some computers, to Nearby County. During the Ebola crisis, UNICO members were able to raise money to help their fellow citizens with prevention, education, and sanitation products. UNICO's next major project is to build a women's empowerment center in Ganta, Nimba County. I am calling on all education professionals, student unions, and parents alike to help create a mentorship program for our youth, especially for our young girls who are more vulnerable to physical, sexual, and mental abuse. Let's work together to give our children hope for a brighter future. Sincerely yours, John Pearson in Washington, D.C. from Barplay, Lower Nearby County, Tapeta District. Well, that's our program for today. We'll see you next time on another edition of Development Matters. So long, everybody.